here's a question for you. What happens to a society if everything is changing, even change itself? Can we cope with that level of change? A lot of people have commented how the pace of change seems to have accelerated over the last 50 years or so. And it has caused a bit of a reaction. Some people have said, no, that's too much. Other people want more change still. And people can sometimes have a bit of conflict around it. It can drive social conflict as well. And on the Burning Archive podcast this week, which I do every week on a Friday night, and I talk about history, culture, and the multipolar world, I try to help you imagine the world more clearly with some history. But on the Burning Archive podcast this week, I talked about this theme of change and how social changes can challenge people's sense of their most precious source of identity. And I explore a wonderful historian's book, the historian is Felipe Fernandez Amesto, and the book is A Foot in the River, Why Our Lives Change. Change is so fundamental to history, and I explore more about it in this podcast. And so I'm going to bring the rest of this uh, video to you with audio and just a quick summary of the themes of the podcast. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you enjoyed this video introduction to my podcast. Do share, like, and subscribe. Remember, you can also listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple, and other platforms. But I'm also keen to share it with all my YouTube videos and encourage you to share and tell some other people about the Burning Archive podcast. And do hang around and listen to, to the rest of the podcast. It's about 40, 45 minutes, and you can just... Uh, listen with your headphones and do some other things while you're listening. See you soon. Change. Do you fear it? Do you embrace it? Do you try to manage it? Whatever your attitude to change, it is always within our lives. Our societies are always changing. It used to be said that the only constant is change, but now it seems the pace of change is accelerating so fast it might even overwhelm us. What happens to societies when everything changes, even change itself? So I turn myself to face me But I've never caught a glimpse How the others must see the faker I'm much too fast to take that test Ch-ch-ch-changes Turn and face the strain Ch-ch-changes Wanna be a richer man? Ch -ch 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 Turn and face the strain. Ch -ch changes. It's gonna have to be a different man. Thou may change me, but I can't waste time. Welcome everyone to the Burning Archive podcast, where we try to see the world more clearly with history and change is one of those central ideas in history and that's what i'm exploring in this podcast today it's the third of three special remastered episodes on the theme of social fragmentation and social change exploring some of the big 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 changes in society over the last century and how they are affecting the world today. And this final episode looks in particular at the work of the great world historian Felipe Fernandez Armesto and his book One Foot in the River why our lives change. It is a fascinating exploration of change. I think you'll enjoy it. Let me just give you a quick reminder that uh, if you hop over to theburningarchive.com, that's now my awful website, and there you'll find out all the details about my books, my substack, my YouTube channel, my podcast, and all 
also my new online course about mindful history. So go over to theburningarchive.com and you'll find there how you can support me by uh, subscribing to those activities. Okay, I'll be back at the end of the show with some special news and do enjoy this special remastered episode on changing everything, including change itself. The historian Felipe Fernandez Amesto writes about the impact of accelerating change on society over the last 50 years. Under the surface of political and economic change lurks fear of instability in the most precious sources of identity. Fernandez Amesto puts his finger on the change I have been describing as social fragmentation. What happens to a society when we change everything, even change itself? That is the question for today's Burning Archive. This theme of social fragmentation is one where I'm not 100% sure what the best term to use to describe it is. So it could be social differentiation or social fracture or social conflict. But for now, I've opted with the term social fragmentation. And in a way, I think the historian Fernandez Amesto is getting to the nub of what I'm trying to understand with that term, which is how social change drives changes of identity or group loyalty and how in turn shifting identities or group loyalties then drive new patterns of conflict or cooperation in society. They may intensify those conflicts, they may find uh, worsening situations, they may even find you know, new and better arrangements for us to live by. But it is driving those changes that go to that precious source of identity that uh, Fernandez Semesto talks about. If I u- could use a visual metaphor on a oral podcast, um, the big social changes like ageing or like changes in family systems, family arrangements, shifts in who claims most power and wealth and status in a society. They're twisting the kaleidoscope of our society. And as these changes accumulate and even accelerate, we're all struggling to adjust our eyes to the new image of the kaleidoscope. The changes are not just big, but rapid and accelerating. And the pace of the change, the constant shifting of that image before our eyes of the kaleidoscope is making us dizzy and forgetful. No sooner than our eyes adjust to one image of the kaleidoscope, but we are presented with another. And then our elites and leaders tell dazed and confused who are thinking privately, hang on, I kind of like the way I live and I'd like to hang on to some of that. Can't there be some continuity mix of change? Well, these leaders and elites say to the dazed and confused, you have no choice. There is no alternative. You must go along with these changes that we're advocating. I wish over you know, my uh, public service career of 30 years, 30 plus years, I guess. Um, I wish I'd had a dollar for every bad managerial or political speech I've had to listen to that advocates some tired old change management trope that we must change or die. If you don't keep, if you stand still, you will die. Uh, There is no alternative but what the change that we're advocating for you should be. 
and that's an understandable and a long-lasting, I guess, literary device used in uh, political discussion. But is it really a surprise that ordinary people sometimes experience these speeches as threats, that they only exacerbate the fears that, as Fernandez Amesto says, their most precious sources of identity are being undermined? Is it a surprise that there is more social distance, conflict, fragmentation and resentment between the elites and the rest? And so I'll be talking not just about social change, but change itself. What exactly is change? And and I'll be talking about it partly by referring to a book by the historian Felipe Fernandez Misto, which is One Foot in the River, Why Our Lives Change. Okay, so I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk about five broad topics – just what is this thing history cause change the ways in which accelerating change affect social identity and fragmentation the importance of cultural change cultural identity to uh, those senses of identity and fragmentation how change itself changes and then finally how we can live better in the present uh, among this rapid and accelerating change. So since this podcast is about history, it's perhaps not surprising at some point we talk about change. What is change? Change and continuity is a big theme in history. What's different and what's the same about today in some era in the past. Some eras seem close to us, the 20th century, 19th century. Some seem much more remote, the Middle Ages, ancient Rome, the Aztecs, pre-conquistadors. How did we slowly change from small bands walking out of Africa to the astonishing human diversity that we encounter across the world and across time. What persists through all that change? What parts of the human animal, let's say, keep appearing in all that diversity? What traditions, what institutions, habits of minds, fundamental social processes, neurological patterns don't change or only change very, very slowly? How much is our experience of history, culture, the society around us a biological imprint? How much do we have within our control? How much can be socially determined, socially changed? What's in our genes? What's in our control? How much is nature? How much is nurture? What is biology? What is culture? What causes change? Is change superficial? Is it real? How strong is it really? All these questions are constant questions you ask in different forms of reflection on history. And within the changes, what form does it have? What story do we tell ourselves about it? Is it a story of progress? Is it a story of evolution? A story of decay, of chaos and randomness? Is it a story of divine providence? Of some, the fates of the gods having their way with we poor humans? Does change in culture or history and change in nature differ? How indeed does change in culture and history lead to change in nature? Is there a reciprocal evolution? Are we in changing our societies 
becoming ever more productive and prolific and wasteful, destroying the planet and the nature that we live in. Is climate change itself historical change? Decay and decline is quite the right way to describe these events. I see vectors of change going in all sorts of different directions and it's hard to give it a simple narrative structure. And this is very much uh, one of the themes or the questions. These, all these questions around change, what is it, how does it occur in history, how does it occur in culture, why is it so common in human cultures? Why is it accelerating? How is that impacting our lives today? These are some of the questions that are addressed in the book by Felipe Fernandez Armesta. That is F-E-L-I-P-E, Fernandez, F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z, hyphen, A-R-M-E-S-T-O. Wonderful book. I will put a link into the sort of, you know, notes on the podcast really worth a read and it's a remarkable reflection on the changes that I've been talking about here on the Burning Archive and since change is so fundamental to history as a style of thought itself, the very nature of history it's and its experience, the discipline itself, it, it is, uh, it's a great insight I guess uh, to, to many things and it would be fair to say he has, he takes big picture view of human history. He's written things about uh, what he calls deep history and he has a background as a environmental historian. So looking at the both changes in the environment, in the nature of planet Earth and human interaction with the environment. It makes him a very fascinating person because he combines that, I guess, scientific, let's say, literacy with deep, deep cultural literacy and something of a witty uh, range of cultural reference. I really love it. Felipe Fernandez Amesto says of this cluster of changes that the world had become rapidly unrecognisable to the ageing whose lives were unprecedentedly prolonged. But, Fernandez Amesto says, the changes in themselves are less menacing than the ways people represent and perceive them. And there are similar other cases of accelerating social change. In moral, we've seen the changes in sexual mores and permissiveness that I've talked about. We've seen various incarnations of debates around abortion, suicide and euthanasia. We've seen debates around drugs, legal, illegal, uh, permitted, tolerated, zero tolerance. We've seen debates around giving offence and the trade-offs between giving offence and speaking the truth, between a sense of shame shame and, and uh I guess celebration of of different types of culture. Some sociologists talk about the transition between uh, an honour culture. I think nineteenth century duels about honour and a dignity culture, which is I guess let's say like twentieth century pride in uh, seeing through difficulty and the emergence of a victim culture, which is more about proclaiming the fact openly and, I guess, without shame, that you have have difficulties with things. These are sort of sociological terms, not pejorative terms, but again, there's a sort of big shift in the nature of people's uh, sense of the culture. And these moral changes, Felipe Fernandez and Mesto, says, are unsettling because they coincide with generation gaps, challenge family solidarity, and have something of the force of taboos. I sense this is part of what's unsettling for many people about the, you know, the woke uh, revolution, debates around transgender and all the rest of it, 
uh, it's it's not just the uh, the sort of immediate issue. It's also how it t- ties into these broader cultural uh, dimensions, moral dimensions. Similarly, huge changes in political change for, for Felipe Fernandez Amesto in his discussion of accelerating change talks about the waning of the American century. So giving more force to my argument that America is a empire in decline. He talks about the dramatic economic change, conscious that his book was written a few years after the 2008 financial crashes, the flagrant dishonesty, the massive change in industry, the driving inequality. Even today we see debates over what currency there should be. There have been huge migrations and changes in populations, vast migration flows, changes across border, and not just permanent migration, but the the much greater level of the population travelling and huge influx of tourism, etc., in societies. All of these things change the actual urban environment, the, the social environment that people live in. And then finally... We have environmental change. And perhaps this is amongst, and it's interesting, it's Fernandez Semester goes to his roots as a environmental historian because he talks about how, how the instability of climate and society, uh, the, the, the instability of the climate seems to overthrow a long-held belief that nature is stable and culture is changeable. We challenge our very concepts of what change and continuity is. We don't have God-given nature, God-given mother nature. We don't have, it seems that Gaia is going out of control. And he refers to the vast increase and acceleration of deforestation, desertification, Species extinction, urbanisation, pollution. No previous generation ever observed the rate of change apparent to us, Fernandez Amisto says, on climate change. And this also has a face of social conflict. Think Greta Thunberg denouncing her elders for being shamefully lazy and, and um, weak and uh, inactive in terms of changing, uh, responding to climate change. But it also has a, a facet of changes in the disease environment, changes in awareness of mental health, in the prevalence of chronic disease, and indeed Felipe Fernandez Amesto, writing several years before COVID, wrote that there's a a gathering pace of the emergence of viruses. But he also says, perhaps prophetically, that it's not just the actual physical changes in disease, it's also how people thought about that change. As, they, as he said it before, the changes in themselves are less man- menacing than the ways people represent and perceive them. And that Fernandez Amisto commented about 10 years ago that most people overvalued health and crippled their economies in responding to these changes. Okay, so cultural change. All these changes, including the kind of huge environmental and anthropogenic type changes that Felipe Fernandez of Misto is talking there affect our sense of identity. You know, he's very much writing on the theme of globalisation, that sense of the same sorts of people all over the world, the same creating a convergent environment across the whole world and the reactions to that going back to his earlier comment that populism is in part a reaction to this accelerating sense of 
change that affects people's precious sources of identity. But perhaps the most troubling and strange changes are not necessarily these external changes, but the strange and peculiar and unpredictable changes that occur within cultures and within traditions themselves. How for no apparent reason sometimes or in response, in some sort of trigger response to events or external conditions, uh, one set of possibilities within a culture suddenly rises up and takes ascendancy over another. One group gives way to another. One idea gives way to another. Felipe Fernandez Amisto says, self-transformation is thorough and disturbing without any outside aid. The examples he gives are about the tending, sort of going back to England after Princess Diana's death and suddenly seeing England, which had had this tradition of a stiff upper lip England, of being buttoned up, unemotional, reserved uh, country, being openly grieving and in tears about Diana. He also refers to the sudden transformation of Spanish culture after the death of General Franco from a, a heavily controlled, moralistic sort of society to a much more uh, free, open, generous, liberal culture. Fernandez Amesto also describes the loss of shared cultural memory, a common stock of reference and illusions, which is in part exacerbated by the disintermediation of the media. The, you know, there is no uh, uh, common banner headline anymore. People all live in their own social media bubbles. And it's more than just the complaint of an ageing pedant, but it's an observation on the social fragmentations that are driven by cultural change. We don't have like the shared newspaper, the, the common stock of references, the common stock of illusions, the shared learning knowledge culture. We don't all go to the same operas, so to speak. And Fernandez Amisto comments that the real reason for the generational culture gap is surely the pace of change, which now replaces the inherited stock of widely recognisable illusions within a single generation and dilutes or disperses common culture almost as soon as it forms. Essentially, this is the paradox I described in my poem of the Burning Archive back in episode 8 of which was Cultural Decay and the Meaning of the Burning Archive, that in this more educated, more culturally productive world than at any time, the sheer scale and volume and diversity and range of cultural material in a way also it makes it impossible to have that sense of shared cultural heritage that shared cultural identity it drives fragmentation as much as it drives meaning and identity as uh, Felipe Fernandez Amesto said what we are experiencing over the last hundred years is not just change but accelerating change and we gave some examples about that and his book is an inquiry into the nature of change not just a diatribe against it Uh, this is the world as it is Um, how do we respond to it he writes that what he is interested in is why have human societies grown so different from each other Why are humans so mutable compared with animals? Why do the changes we call history happen? So change goes to the very heart of what history is all about. The title of Felipe Fernandez Amesto's book, One Foot in the River, 
is a reference to philosophies of change. It's a reference to the Greek pre-Socratic writer or philosopher Heraclitus. That's H-E-R-A-C-L-I-T-U-S, Heraclitus of Ephesus, who's thought to have lived approximately between 535 and 475 BC, so whatever that is, 2,500 years ago. And he wrote these sort of Delphic philosophical texts, deliberately obscure, deliberately sort of strange, I guess. Uh, And one of them was to say that we can never stand in the same river twice. Because, of course, the river, well, not of course, but because the river is a constant flow and it's, it's... form is constantly changing so we might be in the same location but the river is changing around us that's why one foot in the river is the title of this book and in a way a lot of the book is also about a an account of the history of ideas about change is change the constant form of things Or is change an illusion? If everything is change, as Heraclitus also said, then in what way do we have stable natures? Is change really an illusion? And if the most fundamental of our stable natures is biology and the most fundamental form of our changing of our change is culture. What is the link between culture and biology? What is the link between, if you like, science and history? All these ideas are discussed in Fernandez Amesto's book and in a way he does give an answer to the question of his little subtitle of his book, Why Our Lives Change and the limits of evolution because he says that change happens more among humans in Fernandez and Mesto's view due to ideas and imagination. Essentially, he argues our lives change because our biology gives us great powers of anticipation, the planning and foresight to hunt the deer or to gather the seeds from the plants, but poor memories. We have nothing like the memory of animals, but we have these great powers of anticipation. And they have a curious side effect. And that curious side effect, the curious side effect of anticipation, thinking ahead, thinking what could be, thinking what you would do who could be. That is essentially imagination. And this imagination in Fernandez Amesto's view is the human faculty that makes us the most culture-making animals. Not the only culture-making animals. Chimpanzees, lots of animals have forms of culture but we are the most prolific so the biology gives us the framework of change of making culture but once that culture gets going it has its own capricious dynamic of change he compares our own era broadly let's say the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, I guess, to the Ice Age and the sheer difference in terms of the stability of people's lives. Change is not a constant. Over the last hundred years especially, change has accelerated. And in a way, it might even be out of kilter with most of our history of our species. The speed and rapidity of change 
is testing the limits of many people's sense of identity, their capacity to understand and respond constructively to adapt to these changes. In a way, Fernandez Amisto says, the old saying that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same, is no longer true. It just is no longer true. Things are just changing beyond comprehension. And this invites speculation as to whether the change may be too fast, that we're accelerating change beyond our capacity to control the car. We're going too fast. He says cultures, and we might also say societies, thrive on collaboration. And collaboration does rely a little bit on continuity, not just change. That societies and cultures can collapse when they ratchet up too fast, too far. People experience bafflement in the face of apparently uncontrollable changes. And this is where he says he has the explanation for the rise of populism. So the question then is, how can we live better in the present with this accelerating change? Felipe Fernandez Amesto says that change, we have a funny relationship with change, he says. Change was and is something to fear or flee. It can be a threat. Let's face it, maybe that is an invading army. That's my interpolation there. I'm just explaining the comment there. But back to Fernandez Amesto. We still have a love-hate relationship with it, sometimes embracing it in the hope of improvement, sometimes eschewing it in a spirit of scepticism or despair. Change is not bad. But the response to change can be so. Fear of change is destructive. So too is an authoritarian mandating of change. But understanding change, living with change, respecting and tolerating multiple responses to change, that is reasonable. That is perhaps how we can do it. But to do that, we need to understand the change, understand its nature, its limits, and the choices that we have available. We need not lock in our response to change into predetermined narratives of the change. It's not in our nature. It's not necessarily progress. It's not necessarily decay. It's not necessarily what the science says or what the tradition tells us to do. Fernandez Amesto urges us to use that great faculty that is the foundation of change, our imagination, to live better with change in the present. He says, and I quote, The way we live is up to us, not encoded in our genes or any analogous units, nor implicit in evolution, nor determined by our environment. I might add, not even determined by social determinants. If we dislike it, we can reimagine it and strive to refashion it. Reimagine it and strive to refashion it. That is a message of hope, but also something that is in within each of our individual capabilities before such blinding, such paralyzing global changes. In the end, we can tend to our own garden. 
but Fernandez Amisto urges, let's do so peacefully, pluralistically. Let's not be warriors in the cause of change, but let's be generous, pluralistic neighbours in the world of change. Pluralism, accepting that we will never all agree on everything, that we all do have different values, that divergence is perhaps the fundamental course of imaginative beings. Pluralism is the only practical future, Fernandez Amesto says, for a diverse world. And it's interesting, you know, that these this last little series on social fragmentation brings me back in a way to my roots because my back when I was a uh, history student, my PhD was really in, I guess, social history. So I was a social historian and in a funny sort of way, haven't been a historian, but I've been a, a bureaucrat for all these years, but very much working in the field of social policy and in a funny sort of way, practicing a kind of this way of thinking about history because it's it's trying to make sense of what's going on in the society and how we respond to it. So it's interesting that this this uh, this should should bring us back to it. And I think, in a way, as I look back now, I can see how important this theme of social fragmentation is to to the discussion uh, that we've been uh, talking about of political decay, of my four big themes and the sense of the malaise in the world, uh, the sense of crisis, both negative and positive, or certainly a sense that things are, are shifting rapidly. And maybe I would say now, looking on the theme of social fragmentation, that sounds a little bit more like this, that we are seeing four factors compounding. We have rapid social change that affects the way we live, how old we become, what families we form, what social relationships we have, what what kind of jobs we can do. And those changes affect variable factor two, they have identity impacts. They, they're not just changes in the external world. They're changes that affect our minds, our sense of belonging, who we hang out with, who we feel most comfortable with, what we say about ourselves. And then the third factor is the technological amplification of those changes. We have social fragmentation multiplied by social media bubbles. And then the fourth, we have the collapse, so to speak, of mainstream media or or broadcast media. We have, you know, the emergence of, of I guess, independent publishing and, and all sorts of ways in which we can live in, in chosen small communities or chosen small identities. And then finally, we have these sort of cultural viruses, these cultural mutations that occur as a result of the nature of change itself. It's it's strange, chimerical, sort of unpredictable, capricious nature that somehow or other, all of a sudden, some idea will just take off and launch and then be given power by some of these sort of driving forces. And These things combined, combined, I think, create this sense that there is growing conflict, tension in our societies, a sense that, as Matthew Arnold said in Dover Beach, which I think I quoted in episode eight, ignorant armies clashing by night. But... I don't think this is necessarily a story of progress or decay. I think when I first set out on this little journey of explanation, I presented it very much as decay. But looking back now, 
clearly there are changes, vectors of change that are good and bad, but there is this 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 tugging of strings at from multiple places, the sense of losing identity, of losing things that are precious, while at the same time the the hope and promise of imagining different ways of regenerating cultures in ways. So I guess this is a process of inquiry. And I guess why I'm doing the podcast is to work through uh, the perspective I have on these stories, these fragments of the world that pass by my eyes and try to make meaning from it all. On a positive note, that we do have the capacity to reimagine our lives, to change our lives in ways that uses well both changes that are occurring, but also that maintains the continuities that are valuable to us. We don't need to be ruined by the burning archive. We can salvage some things from it while also letting go the things that perhaps are no longer so important. There will be losses, but there will also be gains. So I hope you enjoyed that special remastered episode uh, from one of my earliest, I think it was episode uh, 13, Change Everything But Change Itself. But I've cut a fair bit of material out and tried to focus it on that central problem of how change generates new identities and how, how we respond to change is one of the great challenges of living mindfully with history. And I hope if nothing else that this episode also made you curious about the wonderful historian Felipe Fernandez Armesto and his many great books of uh, world history and interesting reflections on the times that we live in and I'd like to just make a very special announcement that uh, next week I will be interviewing Felipe Fernandez Armesto for the Burning Archive podcast yes very soon probably in the next episode assuming everything goes to plan with my production schedule Felipe Fernandez Armesto will be appearing on the Burning Archive podcast in the meantime if you're interested in my work do head over to theburningarchive.com or go to jeffrich.substack.com there you can subscribe to my free weekly newsletter at theburningarchive.com you can find out about my books my youtube channel my podcast and my new course on mindful approaches to history that can help people in their everyday lives make wise decisions so do check that out and until next week do remember what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee bye now